sketched all his own journals, I said. This is his original, so it makes sense that he did his own scroll work, too, right? Sim nodded and brushed his hair back from his eyes. What do you see there? I slowly pointed from one piece of scroll work to another. Do you see it? Sim shook his head. I pointed again, more precisely. There, I said. And there in the corner. His eyes widened. Letters! I? V? He paused to puzzle them out. Ivari and Emuge. That's what you were rambling about. He pushed the book away. So what's the point, aside from the fact that he was nearly illiterate in Temek? It's not Temek, I pointed out. It's Tima, an archaic usage. What is it even supposed to say? He looked up from his book, his brow creasing. Toward great good? I shook my head. For greater good, I corrected. Sound familiar? I don't know how long she'll be there, one of the loud pair continued. If you miss her, you'll regret it. I told you, I can't tonight. Maybe I'm selling. I'll be free on selling. You should go before then, I told him. The two pennies crowded selling night. They gave me irritated looks. Mind your own business, Slipstick, the taller one said. That got my back up even more. I'm sorry, weren't you talking to me? Did it look like I was talking to you? He said scathingly. It sounded like it, I said. If I can hear you three tables away, you must want me to be part of your conversation. I cleared my throat. The only alternative is that you're too thick to keep your voice down in the tones. His face flushed red, and he probably would have replied. But his friend said something in his ear, and they both gathered their books and left. There was a quiet scattering of applause as the door closed behind him. I gave my audience a smile and a wave. The scribes would have taken care of that, Sim reproached softly as we leaned back over the table to talk. The scribes weren't taking care of it, I pointed out. Besides, it's quiet again, and that's what matters. Now, what does for greater good remind you of? The Amir, of course, he said. It's always the Amir with you lately. What's your point? The point, I whispered excitedly, is that Gibeah was a secret member of the Order Amir. Sim gave me a skeptical look. That's a bit of a stretch, but it's a whole thing. That was about 50 years before they were denounced by the church. They were pretty corrupt by them. I wanted to point out that Gideon wasn't necessarily corrupt. He was pursuing the Amir's purpose, the greater good. While his experiments had been horrifying, his work advanced medicine in ways it was almost impossible to comprehend. His work had probably saved ten times that many lives in the hundreds of years since. However, I doubted Sim would appreciate that point. Corrupt or not, he was a secret member of the Amir. Why else would he hide their credo in the front cover of his journal? Simon shrugged. Fine. He was one of the Amir. What does that have to do with the price of butter? I threw up my hands in frustration and struggled to keep my voice low. That means the Order had secret members before the church denounced them. That means when the Pontifex disbanded them, the Amir had hidden allies. Allies that could keep them safe. That means the Amir could still exist today, in secret, pursuing their work in subtle ways. I noticed a change in Simmons' face. At first, I thought he was about to agree with me. Then I felt a prickle on the back of my neck and realized the truth. Oh, Master Lauren, I greeted him respectfully, without turning around. Speaking with students at other tables is not permitted, he said from behind me. You are suspended for five days. I nodded, and the two of us came to our feet and gathered up our things. Expressionless, Master Lorne reached out a long hand toward me. I handed Gibeah's journal over without comment, and a minute later, we were blinking in the chill winter sunlight outside the archive's doors. 
I pulled my cloak around me and stomped the snow off my feet. Suspend it, Simmons said. That was clever. I shrugged, more embarrassed than I cared to admit. I hoped one of the other students would explain I was actually trying to keep things quiet rather than the other way around. I was just trying to do the right thing. Simon laughed as we began to walk slowly in the direction of anchors. He kicked playfully at a small drift of snow. The world needs people like you, Simon said, in a tone of voice to let me know he was turning philosophical. You get things done. Not always the best way or the most sensible way, but it gets done nonetheless. You're a rare creature. What do you mean? I asked, my curiosity peaked. Slim shrugged. Like today, something bothers you, someone offends you, and suddenly you're off. He made a quick motion with a flat hand. You know exactly what to do. You never hesitate. You just see and react. He was thoughtful for a moment. I imagine that's the way the Amir used to be. Small wonder folk were frightened of him. I'm not always so terribly sure of myself, I admitted. Simmons smiled. I find that strangely reassuring. Chapter 42. Penance. Since studying wasn't an option, and winter was covering everything in drifts of blowing snow, I decided this was the perfect time to catch up on a few things I'd been letting fall by the wayside. I tried to pay Ari a visit, but ice covered the rooftops, and the courtyard where we usually met was full of drifted snow. I was glad I didn't see any footprints, as I didn't think Ari owned shoes, let alone a coat or hat. I would have gone searching for her in the underthink, but the iron grate in the courtyard was locked and iced over. I worked a few double shifts in the Medica and played an extra night at Anchors as an apology for the evening when I had to leave early. I worked long hours in the fishery, calculating, running tests, and casting alloys for my project. I also made a point of catching up on a month of lost sleep. But there was only so much sleeping one person can do, and by the fourth day of my suspension, I'd run out of excuses. As much as I didn't want to, I needed to talk to Davy. By the time I made up my mind to go, the weather had warmed just enough so that the falling snow had turned to sheets of freezing sleet. It was a miserable walk to Imran. I didn't have hat or gloves, and the wind-driven sleet soaked my cloak within five minutes. In ten minutes, I was wet through to the skin and wishing I'd waited or spent the money on a carriage. The sleet had melted the snow on the road, and the damp slush was inches thick. I stopped by the Aeolian to go a bit before heading to Davies, but the building was locked and lightless for the first time I'd ever seen. Small wonder. What noble would come out in this way? What musician would expose their instrument to the freezing dam? So, I slogged my way through the deserted streets, eventually coming to the alley behind the butcher's shop. It was the first time I could remember the stairway not smelling of rancid fat. I knocked on Davy's door, alarmed by how numb my hand was. I could barely feel my knuckles hitting the door. I waited for a long moment, then knocked again, worried that she might not be in, and I'd come all this way for nothing. The door opened just a little. Warm lamplight and a single icy blue eye peered out through the crack. Then the door opened wide. Two to tits and teeth, Davy said. What are you doing out in this? I thought, no, you didn't, she said disparagingly. Get in here. I stepped inside, dripping, the hood of my cloak plastered to my head. She closed the door behind me, then locked and bolted it. Looking around, I noticed she'd added a second bookshelf, though it was still mostly bare. I shifted my weight, and a great mass of damp slush dislodged itself from my cloak and splattered wetly onto the floor. Davy gave me a long, dispassionate looking over. I could see a fire crackling in the grate on the other side of the room near her desk, but she made no indication that I should come any farther into the room. So I remained where I was, dripping and shivering. <coughs> you never do things the easy way, do you? She said. There's an easy way? I asked. She didn't laugh. 
If you think showing up here half frozen and looking like a kicked dog is going to improve my disposition for you, you're terribly... She trailed off and looked at me thoughtfully for another long moment. I'll be damned, she said, sounding surprised. I actually do like seeing you like this. It's lifting my spirits to an almost irritating degree. It wasn't really my intention, I said. But I'll take it. Would it help if I caught a terrible cold? Davy considered it. It might, she admitted. Penance does involve a certain amount of suffering. I nodded, not having to work to be miserable. I dug into my purse with clumsy fingers and brought out a small bronze coin I'd won off Sim playing low stakes breath several nights ago. Davy took it. A penance piece, she said unimpressed. Is this supposed to be symbolic? I shrugged, causing more slush to spatter to the floor. Somewhat, I said. I thought of going to a money changer and settling my entire debt with you in penance coin. What stopped you? She asked. I realized it would just irritate you, I said. And I wasn't looking forward to paying the money changer's fee. I fought the urge to looking longingly at the fireplace. I've spent a lot of time trying to think of some gesture that might make a suitable apology to you. You decided it would be best to walk here during the worst weather of the year. I decided it would be best if we talked, I said. The weather was just a happy accident. Davy scowled and turned toward the fireplace. Come in, then. She walked over to a chest of drawers near her bed and brought out a thick blue cotton robe. She handed it to me and motioned to a closed door. Don't change out of your wet clothes. Bring them out in the basin or they'll take forever to dry. I did as she said, then brought the clothes out and hung them on the pegs in front of the fire. It felt wonderful to stand so close to the fireplace. In the light of the fire, I could see that the skin under my fingernails was actually a little blue. As much as I wanted to linger and warm myself, I joined Davy at her desk. I noticed that the top of it had been sanded down and re-varnished, though it still bore a coal black ring where the poor boy had charred the wood. I felt rather vulnerable sitting there wearing nothing but the robe she'd given me, but there was nothing to be done about it. After our previous meeting, I fought to avoid looking at the charred ring on her desk. You informed me that the full amount of my loan would be due at the end of the term. Are you willing to negotiate that? Unlikely, Davy said crisply. But rest assured that if you are unable to settle accounts in coin, I am still in the market for certain pieces of information. She gave a sharp, hungry smile. I nodded. She still wanted access to the archives. I was hoping you might be willing to reconsider, as you now know the whole story, I said. Someone was performing malfeasance against me. I needed to know that my blood was safe. I gave her a questioning look. Davy shrugged without taking her elbows off the desk, her expression one of vast indifference. What's more, I said, meeting her eye, it is entirely possible that my irrational behavior might have been partially due to the lingering effect of an alchemical poison I was subjected to earlier this term. Davy's expression went stiff. What? She hadn't known that. That was something of a relief. Ambrose arranged to have me dosed with the plum bob about an hour before my admission to the I said. And you sold him the formula. You have a lot of gall. Davy's pixie face was outraged and indignant, but it wasn't convincing. He was off the bat and trying too hard. What I have, I said calmly, is the lingering taste of plum and nutmeg in my mouth and the occasional irrational desire to kill people for doing nothing more offensive than jostling me on the street. Her false outrage fell away. You can't prove anything, she said. I don't need to prove anything, I said. I have no desire to see you in trouble with the masters or up against the iron law. I looked at her. I just thought you might be interested in the fact that I was poisoned. Davy sat very still. She fought to maintain her composure, but guilt was creeping onto her expression. Was it bad? It was.
I said quietly. Davy looked away and crossed her arms in front of her chest. I didn't know it was for Ambrose, she said. Sometimes Tosh came around, made a stunningly good offer. She looked back at me. Now that the chilly anger had left her, she looked surprisingly small. I'd never do business with Ambrose, she said, and I didn't know it was for you. I swear. You knew it was for someone, I said. There was a long moment of silence, broken only by the occasional crackling of the fire. Here's how I see it, I said. Recently, we've both done something rather foolish, something we regret. I pulled the robe more closely around my shoulders. And while these two things certainly don't cancel each other out, it does seem to me that they establish some sort of equilibrium. I held out my hands like they were the balancing plates on a scale. Davy gave me a small, embarrassed smile. Perhaps I was hasty in demanding full repayment. I returned the smile and felt myself relax. How would you feel about sticking to the original terms of our loan? That seems fair. Davy held out her hand over the desk, and I shook it. The last of the tension in the room evaporated, and I felt a long-standing piece of worry unknot itself in my chest. Your hand is freezing, Davy said. Let's go sit by the fire. We relocated ourselves and sat quietly for several minutes. God be low, Davy said with an explosive sigh. I was so angry with you. She shook her head. I don't know if I've ever been that angry with anyone in my whole life. I nodded. I didn't really believe you'd stoop to malfeasance, I said. I was so sure it couldn't be you, but everyone kept talking about how dangerous you were, telling stories. Then when you wouldn't let me see my blood, I trailed off, shrugging. Are you really still getting after echoes from the plumb bob? She asked. Little flashes, I said, and I seem to be losing my temper more easily, but that might just be the stress. Simmons says I probably have unbound principles in my system, whatever that means. Davy scowled. I'm working with less than ideal equipment here, she said, gesturing to a closed door. And I'm sorry, but the fellow offered me a full set of the Vautium Tegnaste. She waved to the bookshelves. Normally, I'd never make something like that, but unexpurgated copies are just impossible to find. I turned to look at her, surprised. You made it for him? It's better than handing over the formula. Davy said defensively. Part of me felt like I should be angry, but the majority of me was simply happy that I was warm and dry with no threat of death hanging over me. I shrugged it off. Simmons says you can't factor worth half a damn, I said conversationally. Davy looked down at her hands. I'm not proud of selling, she admitted. Then after a moment, she looked up again, grinning. But the Tegnaste has gorgeous illustrations. I laughed. Show me. Hours later, my clothes were dry and the sleet had changed to gentle snow. Stonebridge would be a solid sheet of ice, but other than that, the walk home would be much more pleasant. When I emerged from the washroom, I saw Davy was sitting back at her desk. I made my way over and handed her the robe. I won't impugn your honor by asking why you own a robe much longer and broader in the shoulder than anything a delicate young lady of your size could ever wear. Davy snorted indelicately and rolled her eyes. I sat down and tugged on my boots. They were delightfully warm from sitting near the fire. Then I brought out my purse and laid three heavy silver talents on the desk, pushing them toward her. Davy looked at them curiously. I've recently come into a little money, I said. Not enough to settle my whole debt, but I can pay this term's interest early. I waved a hand at the coins. A gesture of good faith. Davy smiled and pushed the coins back across the table. You've still got two span before the end of the term, she said. Like I said, let's stick to our original deal. I'd feel bad about taking your money early. Though I'd offered Davy the money as an honest peace offering, 
I was glad to keep my three talents for now. There is a vast difference between having some coin and no coin. There is a feeling of helplessness that comes from having an empty purse. It's like seed grain. At the end of a long winter, if you have some grain left, you can use it for seed. You have control over your life. You can use that grain and make plans for the future. But if you have no grain for seed in the spring, you are happy. <coughs> no amount of hard work or good intention will make crops grow if you don't have the seed to start with. So I bought clothes, three shirts, a new pair of pants, and thick woolen socks. I bought a hat and gloves and scarf to keep away the winter's chill. For arms, I bought a pouch of sea salt, a sack of dried peas, two jars of peach preserves, and a pair of warm slippers. I bought a set of loot strings, ink, and a half dozen sheets of paper. I also bought a sturdy brass drop bar and screwed it to the window frame in my tiny garret room. I could circumvent it fairly easily, but it would keep my few possessions safe from even the most well-intentioned thieves. Chapter 43 Without Word or Warning I stared out the front window of anchors, looking at the falling snow and idly turning Denna's ring over in my fingers. Winter lay heavy over the university, and Denna had been gone for more than a month. I had three hours before class with Elogan, and I was trying to decide if the slim chance of finding Denna was worth the long, cold walk to Imran. As I stood at the window, a sealish man came through the door, stomping the powdery snow from his boots and looking around curiously. It was still early in the day, and I was the only person in the common room. He walked over to me, snowflakes melting in his beard until they were bright beads of water. Sorry to bother you. I'm looking for a fellow, he said, surprising me with his utter lack of anything resembling a sealish accent. He reached inside his long coat and pulled out a thick envelope with a blood-red seal. Tavothi, he read slowly then turned the envelope toward me so I could see the front. Cool. Anchors in. University. Two miles west of the ring. Felony Baron. Central Commonwealth. It was Dennis' handwriting. It's cool, actually, I said absentmindedly. The E is silent. He shrugged. You him? I am, I said. He nodded, satisfied. Well, I got this down in Tarbian about a span back. Bought it off of a fellow for a hard penny. He said he bought it off of a sailor in Jumpui for a vintage silver bit. He couldn't remember the name of the town where the sailor had got it from, but it was inland a ways. The man met my eye. I'm telling you this so you don't think I'm trying to shim you on the deal. I paid a full hard penny, then came over myself from Imre, though it was out of my way. He looked around the common room. So, I'm guessing a fellow with a fine inn such as this won't quibble about giving a fellow his due. I laughed. This isn't my inn, I said. I just have a room here. Oh, he said, obviously a little disappointed. You looked kind of proprietorial standing there. Still, I'm sure you see I need to make my money off this. I do, I said. How much do you think is fair? He looked me up and down, eyeing my clothes. I suppose I'd be happy making my hard penny back and a soft penny besides. I brought out my purse and fished around in it. Luckily, I'd been playing cards a few nights before and had some a in currency. Seems fair, I said as I handed over the money. He started to go, then turned back. Out of curiosity, he asked. Would you have paid two hard pennies to get it? Probably, I admitted. Kissed. He swore, then headed back outside, the door banging behind him. The envelope was heavy parchment, wrinkled and smudged with much handling. The seal showed a stag rampant standing before a barrel and a harp. I pressed it hard between my fingers, shattering it as I sat down. The letter read, Quote, I'm sorry to leave Imre without word or warning. I sent you a message the night of my departure, but I expect you never received it. I have gone abroad looking for greener pasture and better opportunity. 
I am fond of Emily, and enjoy the pleasure of your occasional, though sporadic, company. But it is an expensive city in which to live, and my prospects have grown slender of late. Yale is lovely, all lonely hills. I find the weather quite to my liking. It is warm, and the air smells of the sea. It seems I might pass an entire winter without being brought to bed by my life, my first in years. I have spent some time in the small kingdoms, and saw a skirmish between two bands of mounted men. Such a crashing and screaming of horses you have never heard. I have spent some time afloat as well, and learned all manner of sailors' knots and how to spit properly. Also, my cussing has been greatly broadened. If you ask politely when we next meet, I may demonstrate my newfound skill. I have seen my first Adam mercenary. They call them bloodshirts here. She is hardly bigger than me, with quite the most remarkable gray eyes. She is pretty, but strange and quiet, endlessly twitching. I have not seen her fight, and I am not sure I wish to, though I am curious. I am still enamored of the heart, and I am currently housing with a skilled gentleman whom I shall not name, for the furtherance of my study in this. I have drunk some wine while writing this letter. I mention this to excuse my above spelling of the word furtherance. Furtherance. Kissed. You know what I mean. I apologize for not writing sooner, but I have been a great deal traveling, and not until now have I had means to write a letter. Now that I have done, I expect it might be a while longer before I find a traveler I trust to start this missive on its long road back to you. I think of you often and fondly. Yours, D. Postscript. I hope your loop case is serving you well. Elodin's class began strangely that day. For once, Elodin was actually on time. This caught us unprepared, as the six remaining students had taken to spending the first twenty or thirty minutes of the class gossiping, playing cards, and griping about how little we were learning. We didn't even notice Master Namer until he was halfway down the steps of the lecture hall, clapping his hands to get our attention. The second odd thing was that Elodin was dressed in his formal robes. I'd seen him wear them before, when occasion demanded, but always grudgingly. Even during admissions interviews, they were usually rumpled and unkempt. Today, he wore them as if he meant it. They looked sharp and freshly laundered. His hair wasn't in its normal state of dishevel, either. It looked like it had been trimmed and combed. Reaching the front of the lecture hall, he climbed onto the dais and moved to stand behind the lectern. This, more than anything, made everyone sit up and take notice. Elodin never used the lectern. Long ago, he said without any preamble, this was a place where people came to learn secret things. Men and women came to the university to study the shape of the world. Elodin looked out at us. In this ancient university, there was no skill more sought after than naming. All else was base metal. Namers walked these streets like tiny gods. They did terrible, wonderful things, and all others envied them. Only through skill and naming did students move through the ranks. An alchemist without any skill in naming was regarded as a sad thing, no more respected than a cook. Sympathy was invented here, but a sympathist without any naming might as well be a carriage driver. An artificer with no names behind his work was little more than a cobbler or a smith. They all came to learn the names of things, Elodin said his dark eyes intense, his voice resonant and stirring. But naming cannot be taught by rule or rote. Teaching someone to be a namer is like teaching someone to fall in love. It is hopeless. It cannot be done. Master Namer smiled a bit then, for the first time looking like his familiar self. Still, students tried to learn, and teachers tried to teach, and sometimes they succeeded. Elodin pointed. Bella! He motioned for her to approach. Come! Bella stood, looking nervous, as she climbed up to join him on the lecturer's dais. You have all chosen the name you hope to learn, Elodin said, his eyes sweeping over us. And you have all pursued your studies with varying degrees of dedication and success. 
I fought the urge to look away shamefacedly, knowing that my efforts had been half-hearted at best. Where you have failed, Bella has succeeded, Logan said. She has found the name of stone. He turned sideways to look at her. How many times? Eight times, she said, looking down, her hands twisting nervously in front of her. There was a murmur of genuine awe from all of us. She had never mentioned this in our frequent griping sessions. Elodie nodded, as if approving of our reaction. When naming was still taught, we namers wore our prowess proudly. A student who gained mastery over a name would wear a ring as declaration of their skill. Elodin stretched out a hand in front of Bella and opened it, revealing a river stone, smooth and dark. And this is what Bella will do now, as proof of her ability. Startled, Bella looked at Elodin. Her eyes flickered back and forth between him and the stone, her face growing stricken and pale. Elodin gave her a reassuring smile. Come now, he said gently. You know in your secret heart you are capable of this and more. Bella bent her lips and took hold of the stone. It seemed bigger in her hands than it had in his. She closed her eyes for a moment and drew a long, deep breath. She let it out slowly, lifted the stone, and opened her eyes so it was the first thing she would see. Bella stared at the stone, and there was a moment's silence. The tension in the room built until it was tight as a harp string. The air vibrated with it. A long minute passed. Two long minutes. Three terribly long minutes. Elodin sighed gustily, breaking the tension. No, 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 he said, snapping his fingers near her face to get her attention. He pressed a hand over her eyes like a blindfold. You're looking at it. Don't look at it. Look at it. He pulled his hand away. Bella lifted the stone and opened her eyes. At the same moment, Elodin gave her a sharp slap on the back of the head with the flat of his hand. She turned to him, her expression outraged, but Elodin merely pointed at the stone she still held in her hand. Look, he said excitedly. Bella's eyes went to the stone, and she smiled as if seeing an old friend. She covered it with a hand and brought it close to her mouth. Her lips moved. There was a sudden, sharp, cracking sound, as if a speck of water had been dropped into a pan of hot grease. There followed dozens more, so sharp and quick, they sounded like an old man popping his knuckles, or a storm of hailstones hitting a hard slate roof. Fella opened her hand, and a scattering of sand and gravel spilled out. With two fingers, she reached into the jumble of loose stone and pulled out a ring of sheer black stone. It was round as a cup and smooth as polished glass. Elodin laughed in triumph before sweeping Fella into an enthusiastic hug. Fella threw her arms around him wildly in return. They took several quick steps together that were half staggered, half dance. Still grinning, Elodin held out his hand. Fella gave him the ring, and he looked it over carefully before nodding. Fella, he said seriously. I hereby promote you to the rank of Relar. He held up the ring. Your hand. Almost shyly, Bella held out her hand, but Elodin shook his head. Left hand, he said firmly. The right means something else entirely. None of you are anywhere near ready for that. <laughs> Bella held out her other hand, and Elodin slid the ring of stone easily onto her finger. <laughs> I'll be right back.
Yes, I am back. I know you are all very impatient to see me. The rest of the class broke into applause, rushing close to get a look at what she had done. Bella gave a radiant smile and held out her hand for all of us to see. The ring wasn't smooth as I'd first thought. It was covered in a thousand tiny flat facets. They circled each other in a subtle swirling pattern, unlike anything I'd ever seen before. Chapter 44 The Catch Despite the trouble with Ambrose, my obsession with the archives, and my countless fruitless trips to Imray hunting Denna, I managed to finish my project in the fishery. I would have liked another span of days to run a few more tests and tinker with it, but I was simply out of time. The admissions lottery was coming up soon, and my tuition would be due not long after. Before I could put my project up for sale, I needed Kilvin to approve my design. So it was with no small amount of trepidation that I knocked on the door of Kilvin's office. The master artificer was hunched over his personal work table, carefully removing the screws from the bronze casing of a compression pump. He didn't look up as he spoke. Yes, Relark Wolf. I'm finished, Master Kilvin, I said simply. He looked up at me, blinking. Are you now? Yes. I was hoping to make an appointment so I might demonstrate it to you. Kilvin set the screws in a tray and brushed his hands together. For this, I am available now. I nodded and led the way through the busy workshop, past stocks, to the private workroom Kilvin had assigned me. I brought out the key and unlocked the heavy timber door. It was large, as workrooms go, with its own firewell, anvil, fume hood, drench, and other assorted staples of the artificing trade. I'd push the work table aside to leave half of the room empty except for several thick bales of straw stacked against the wall. Hanging from the ceiling in front of the bales was a crude scarecrow. I dressed it in my burned shirt and a pair of sackcloth pants. Part of me wished I'd run a few more tests in the time it had taken to sew the pants and stuff the straw man. But at the end of the day, I am a trooper first and all else second. As such, I couldn't ignore the chance for a little show. <coughs> we closed the door behind Excuse us me. while Kilvin looked around the room curiously. Deciding to let my work speak for itself, I brought out the crossbow and handed it to him. The huge master's expression went dark. Relark Wolf, he said, his voice heavy with disapproval. Tell me you have not squandered the labor of your hands on the improvement of such a beastly thing. Trust me, Master Kilvin, I said, holding it out to him. He gave me a long look, then took the crossbow and began to examine it with the meticulous care of a man who spent every day working with deadly equipment. He fingered the tightly woven string and eyed the curved metal arm of the bow. After several long minutes, he nodded put one foot through the stirrup, and cocked it without any noticeable effort. Idly, I wondered how strong Kilvin was. My shoulders ached, and my hands were blistered from struggling with the unwieldy thing over the last several days. I handed him the heavy bolt, and he examined it as well. I could see him looking increasingly perplexed. I knew why. The bow didn't have any obvious modifications or signalry. Neither did the bolt. Kilvin slotted the bolt into the crossbow and raised an eyebrow at me. I made an expansive gesture to the straw man, trying to look more confident than I felt. My hands were sweating, and my stomach was full of doves. Tests were fine and good. Tests were important. Tests were like rehearsal. But all that really matters is what happens when the audience is watching. This is a truth all troopers know. Kilvin shrugged and raised the crossbow. It looked small braced against his broad shoulder, and he took a moment to carefully sight along the top of it. 
I was surprised to see him calmly draw half a breath, then exhale slowly as he pulled the trigger. The crossbow jerked, the string twanged, the bolt blurred. There was a harsh metallic clank, and the bolt stopped midair as if it had struck an invisible wall. It clattered to the stone floor in the middle of the room, fifteen feet away from the straw man. Unable to help myself, I laughed and threw my arms triumphantly into the air. Kilvin raised his eyebrows and looked at me. I grinned a manic grin. The master retrieved the bolt from the floor and examined it again. Then he recocked the crossbow, sighted, and pulled the trigger. Clank! The bolt dropped to the floor a second time, skittering slightly to one side. This time, Kilvin spotted the source of the noise. Hanging from the ceiling in the far corner of the room was a metal object the size of a large lantern. It was rocking back and forth and spinning slightly, as if someone had just struck it a glancing blow. I took it off its hook and brought it back to where Master Kilvin waited at the work table. What is this thing, Relarquo? he said curiously. I set it down on the table with a heavy clunk. In general terms, Master Kilvin, it's an automatically triggered kinetic opposition device. I beamed proudly. More specifically, it stops arrows. Kilvin tried <coughs> to look at it, but there was nothing to see except for featureless plates of dark iron. My creation looked like nothing so much as a large, eight-sided lantern made entirely of metal. And what do you call it? That was the one part of my invention I hadn't managed to finish. I thought of a hundred names, but none of them seemed to fit. Arrow Trap was pedestrian. The Traveler's Friend was prosaic. Bandit Bane was ridiculously melodramatic. I could never have looked Kilvin in the eye again if I tried to call it that. I'm having some trouble with the name, I admitted. But for now, I'm calling it an arrow catch. Hmm, Kilvin grunted. It does not catch the arrow, precisely. I know, I said, exasperated. But it was either that or call it a clank. Kilvin looked at me sideways, his eyes smiling a little. One would think a student of your loadings would prove more facile with his name, my lark woe. Delavari had it easy, Master Kilvin, I said. He just made a better axle and stuck his name on it. I can't very well call this the coal. Kilvin chuckled. Ooh. He turned back to the arrow catch, eyeing it curiously. How does it work? I grinned and brought out a large roll of paper covered in diagrams, complicated signatures, metallurgical symbols, and painstaking formula for kinetic conversion. There are two main parts, I said. The first is the signatory that automatically forms a sympathetic link with any thin, fast-moving piece of metal within 20 feet. I don't mind telling you, that took me a long couple of days to figure out. I tapped the appropriate runes on the piece of paper. At first, I thought that might be enough by itself. I hoped if I bound an incoming arrowhead to a stationary piece of iron, it would absorb the arrow's momentum and make it harmless. Kilvin shook his head. It has been tried before. I should have realized before I even tried, I said. At best, it only absorbs a third of the arrow's momentum, and anyone two-thirds arrow shot is still going to be in a bad way. I gestured to a different diagram. What I really needed was something that could push back against the arrow, and it had to push very fast and very hard. I ended up using the spring steel from a bear trap to modify the force. I picked up a spare arrowhead from the work table and pretended it was moving toward the arrow catch. First, the arrow comes close and establishes the binding. Second, the incoming arrow's momentum sets off the trigger, just like stepping on a trap. I snapped my fingers sharply. Then, the spring's stored energy pushes back at the arrow, stopping it or even knocking it backward. Sylvan was nodding along. If it needs to be reset after we shoot, I'll get it stop my second ball. I pointed to the central diagram. This wouldn't be of much use if it only stopped one arrow, I said, or if it only stopped arrows coming from one direction. I designed it to have eight springs in a circle. 
It should be able to stop arrows from several directions at once. I shrugged apologetically. <coughs> In theory. I haven't been able to test that. Kilvin looked back at the straw man. Both of my shots came from the same direction, he said. How was the second one stopped if that spring had already been triggered? I picked up the arrow catch by the ring I'd set into the top and showed how it could rotate freely. It hangs in a pivot ring, I said. The shock of the first arrow set it spinning slightly, which brought a new spring into alignment. Even if it hadn't, the energy of the incoming arrow tends to swing it around to the nearest untriggered spring, like a weather vane points into the wind. I hadn't actually planned the last. It had been a lucky accident, but I didn't see any reason to tell Kilvin that. I touched the red dots visible on two of the eight iron faces of the arrow catch. These show which springs have been triggered. Kilvin took it from me and turned it in his hands. How do you reset the springs? I slid a metal device out from under the work table, little more than a piece of iron with a long lever attached. Then, I showed Kilvin the eight-sided hole in the bottom of the arrow catch. I fit the arrow catch onto the device and pressed down on the lever with my foot until I heard a sharp click. Then I rotated the arrow catch and repeated the process. Kilvin bent to pick it up and turned it over in his huge hands. Heavy, he commented. It needed to be sturdy, I said. A crossbow bolt can punch through a two-inch oak plank. I needed the spring to snap back with at least three times that much force to stop the arrow. Kilvin shook the arrow catch idly, holding it to the side of his head. It didn't make any noise. And what if the arrowheads are not made of metal? He asked. These Sambi raiders are said to use arrows of flint or obsidian. I looked down at my hands and sighed. Well, I said slowly, if the arrowheads aren't some sort of iron, the arrow catch wouldn't trigger when they came within 20 feet. Kilvin gave a non-committal grunt and set the arrow catch back down on the table with a thump. But, I said brightly, when it came within 15 feet, any piece of sharp stone or glass would trigger a different set of bindings. I tapped my schema. I was proud of it, as I'd also had the foresight to inscribe the inset pieces of obsidian with the sigildry for twice tough glass. That way, it wouldn't shatter under the impact. Kilvin glanced at the schema, then grinned proudly and chuckled deep in his chest. Good, good. What if the arrow has a head of bone or ivory? The runes for bone aren't trusted to a lowly relar like myself, I said. And if they were, Kilvin asked. Then I still wouldn't use them, I said, lest some child doing a cartwheel trigger the arrow catch with a thin, quickly moving piece of their skull. Kilvin nodded his approval. I was thinking of a galloping horse, he said. But you sure your wisdom is. You sure you have the careful mind of an artist. I turned back to the schema and pointed. That said, Master Kilvin, at ten feet, a fast-moving cylindrical piece of wood will trigger the arrow catch. I sighed. It's not a good link, but it's enough to stop the arrow, or at least deflect it. Kilvin bent to examine the schema more closely, his eyes wandering the crowded page for a long couple of minutes. All iron? he asked. Closer to steel, Master Kilvin. I worried iron would be too brittle in the long term. And each of these 18 bindings are inscribed on each of the springs? He asked, gesturing. I nodded. That is a great duplication of effort, Dylan said, his tone more conversational than accusatory. Some might say such a thing is overbuilt. I care very little what other people think, Master Kilvin, I said. Only what you think. He grunted, then looked up from the paper and turned to face me. I have four questions. I nodded expectantly. First, of all things, why make this? He asked. No one should ever die from ambush on the road, I said firmly. Kilvin waited, but I had nothing more to say in the matter. After a moment, he shrugged and gestured to the other side of the room. Second, where did you get the... 
his brow furrowed slightly. Terebra, the flag ball. My stomach clenched at the question. I'd held the vain hope that Kilvin, being silly, wouldn't know such things were illegal here in the common law. Barring that, I'd hoped he simply wouldn't ask. I procured it, Master Kilvin, I said evasively. I needed it to test the arrow catch. Why not use a simple hunter's bow, Kilvin said sternly, and thereby avoid the need of illegal procurement. It would be too weak, Master Kilvin. I needed to be sure my design would stop any arrow, and a crossbow fires a bolt harder than any other. A Muldegan longbow is equal of a flat bow, Kilvin said. But the use of one is beyond my skill, I said, and the purchase of a Muldegan bow is far beyond my means. Kilvin let out a deep sigh. Before, when you made your thief's lamp, you made a bad thing in a good way. That I do not like. He looked down at the schema. This time you have made a good thing in a bad way. That is better, but not entirely. Best is to make a good thing in a good way. Agreed? I nodded. He lay one massive hand on the crossbow. Did anyone see you with it? I shook my head. Then we will say it is mine, and you procured it under my advisement. It will join the equipment in stocks. He gave me a hard look. And in the future, you will come to me if you need such things. That stung at him, as I'd been planning on selling it back to sleep. Still, it could have been worse. The last thing I wanted was to run afoul of the iron law. Third, I see no mention of gold wire or silver in your schema, he said. Nor can I imagine any use they could be put to in such a device as yours. Explain why you have checked these materials out of stocks. I was suddenly pointedly aware of the cool metal of my gram against the inside of my arm. Its inlay was gold, but I could hardly tell him that. I was short on money, Master Kilvin, and I needed materials I couldn't get in stock, such as your flat bow. I nodded. And the straw and the bear traps. Wrong follows wrong, Kilvin said disapprovingly. The stocks are not a money lender stolen, should not be used as such. I am rescinding your precious metals authorization. I bowed my head, hoping I looked appropriately chastised. You will also work twenty hours in stocks as your punishment. If anyone asks, you will tell them what you did and explain that as a punishment you are forced to repay the value of the metal, plus an additional 20%. If you use stocks as a money lender, you will be charged interest like a money lender. I winced at that. Yes, Master Kilvin. Last, Kilvin said, turning to lay one huge hand on the arrow catch. What do you imagine such a thing would sell for, Relac Bull? My heart rose in my chest. Does that mean you approve it for sale, Master Kilvin? The great bear-like artificer gave me a puzzled look. Of course I approve it, Relark Wolf. It is a wondrous thing. It is an improvement to the world. Every time a person sees such a thing, they will see how artificery is used to keep men safe. They will think well of all artificers for the making of such a thing. He looked down at the arrow catch, frowning thoughtfully. But if we are going to sell it, it must have a price. What do you suggest? I'd been wondering on this question for six span. The simple truth was, I hoped it would bring me enough money to pay for my tuition and my interest on Davy's loan, enough to keep me in the university for one more term. I honestly don't know, Master Kilvin, I said. How much would you pay to avoid having a long yard of ash arrow shot through your lung? He chuckled. My lung is quite valuable, he said, but let us think in other terms. Materials come to, he glanced at the schema, roughly nine jots. Am I correct? Uncannily correct. I nodded. How many hours did it take you to make? About a hundred, I said. Maybe a hundred and twenty, but a lot of that was experimentation and testing. 
I could probably make another in fifty or sixty hours. Less if moldings are made. Kilvin nodded. I suggest twenty-five talents. Does that seem reasonable to you? The sum took my breath away. Even after I repaid stocks for materials and the workshop took its forty percent commission, it was six times more than I'd earned working on death man. An almost ridiculous amount of money. I began to agree enthusiastically. Then a thought occurred to me. Though it pained me, I slowly shook my head. Honestly, Master Kilvin, I'd prefer to sell them more cheaply than that. He raised an eyebrow. They will pay, he reassured me. I have seen people pay more for less useful things. I shrugged. Twenty-five talents is a lot of money, I said. Safety and peace of mind shouldn't only be available to those with heavy purses. I think eight would be a great plenty. Kilvin looked at me for a long moment, then nodded. As you say, eight pounds. He ran his hand over the top of the arrow catch, almost petting it. However, as this is the first and only one in existence, I will pay you twenty-five for it. It will go in my personal collection. He cocked his head at me. Linsapa? Lin, I said gratefully, feeling a great weight of anxiety lifting off my shoulders. Kilvin smiled and nodded toward the table. I would also like to examine the schema at my leisure. Would you like to make me a copy? For twenty-five talents, I said, smiling as I slid the paper across the table. You can have the original. Kilvin wrote me a receipt and left, clutching the arrow catch like a child with a new favorite toy. I hurried to stocks with my slip of paper. I had to settle my debt for materials, including the gold wire and silver ingots. But even after the workshop took its commission, I was left with almost eleven talents. I went through the remainder of the day grinning and whistling like an idiot. It is as they say, a heavy purse makes for a light heart. Chapter 45, Consortation I sat on the hearth at Anchors with my lute in my lap. The room was warm and quiet, full of people who had come to hear me play. Felling was my regular night at Anchors, and it was always busy. Even in the worst weather, there weren't enough chairs, and those who came late were forced to cluster around the bar and lean against walls. Lately, Anchor had needed to bring in an extra girl on felling night just to hurry drinks around the room. Outside the inn, winter was still clutching at the university, but inside the air was warm and sweet with the smell of beer and bread and broth. Over the months, I had slowly trained my audience to be properly attentive while I played, so the room was hushed as I fingered my way through the second verse of Violet Vibe. I was in fine form that night. My audience had bought me half a dozen drinks, and in a fit of generosity, a tipsy scribe had tossed a hard penny into my loot case, where it lay shining among the dull iron and copper. I'd made Simmons cry twice, and Anchor's new serving girl was smiling and blushing at me with such frequency that even I couldn't miss the signal. She had beautiful eyes. For the first time I could remember, I actually felt like I had some control over my life. There was money in my purse. My studies were going well. I had access to the archives, and despite the fact that I was forced to work in stocks, everyone knew Kilvin was terribly pleased with me. The only thing missing was Denna. I looked down at my hands as I entered into the final chorus of Violet Bye. I'd had a few more drinks than I was used to, and I didn't want to fumble. As I watched my fingers, I heard the door of the tap room open and felt a chill wind curl around the room. The fire swayed and danced beside me as I heard boots moving across the wooden floor. The room was quiet as I sang. She sits by her window. She sips at her tea. She waits for her love to return from the sea. Her suitors come calling. She watches the tide. And all the while, Violet buys. I hit the final chord, but instead of the thunderous applause I expected, there was only an echoing quiet. 
I looked up and saw four tall men standing in front of the hearth. The shoulders of their heavy cloaks were wet with melted snow. Their faces were grim. Three of them wore the dark round caps that marked them as constables. And if that weren't clue enough as to their business, each of them carried a long oak cudgel bound in iron. They watched me like hard-eyed hawks. The fourth man stood aside from the others. He didn't wear a constable's cap and wasn't nearly so tall or broad across the shoulders. Despite that, he carried himself with undeniable authority. His face was lean and grim as he drew out a piece of heavy parchment decorated with several black official-looking seals. Quote, Arladin's son, he read aloud to the room, his voice clear and strong. In the sight of these witnesses, I bind you to stand to your own account before the iron law. You are charged with consultation with demonic powers, malicious use of unnatural arts, unprovoked assault, and malfeasance. Needless to say, I was caught completely flat-footed. What? I said stupidly. As I said, I'd had more than a few drinks. The grim man ignored me and turned to one of the constables. Bind him! One of the constables drew out a length of clattering iron chain. Up until now, I'd been too startled to be properly afraid. But the sight of this grim-faced man pulling a pair of dark iron manacles out of a sack filled me with a fear that turned my bones to water. Simon appeared next to the hearth, pushing his way past the constables to stand in front of the fourth man. What exactly is going on here? Sim demanded, his voice hard and angry. It was the only time I'd ever heard him sound like the son of a duke. Explain yourself! The man holding the party <coughs> behind Simon calmly, then reached inside his cloak and brought out a stout iron rod with a band of gold around each end. Sim paled a bit as the grim man held it up for everyone in the room to see. Not only was it every bit as threatening as the constable's cudgels, the rod was an unmistakable symbol of his authority. The man was a sumner for the Commonwealth courts. Not just a regular sumner, either. The gold bands meant he could order anyone to stand before the iron law. Priests, government officials, even members of the nobility up to the rank of baron. At this point, Anchor made his way through the crowd as well. He and Sim looked over the Sumner's document and found it to be very legitimate and official. It was signed and sealed by all manner of important people in Imran. There was nothing to be done. I was going to be brought up against the Iron Law. Everyone at Anchor's watched as I was bound hand and foot in chains. Some of them looked shocked, some confused, but most of them simply looked frightened. When the constables dragged me through the crowd toward the door, barely a handful of my audience were willing to meet my eye. They marched me the long way back to Inret, over Stone Bridge, and down the flat expanse of the Great Stone Road. All the way, the winter wind chilled the iron around my hands and feet until it burned and bit and froze my skin. The next morning, Sim arrived with al Sadaf, and matters slowly became clear. It had been months since I had called the name of the wind in Imre after Ambrose broke my lute. The masters had brought me up on charges of malfeasance and had me publicly whipped at the university. It had been so long ago that the lash marks on my back were nothing more than pale silver stars. I had thought the matter was all. Apparently not. Since the incident had occurred in Imre, it fell under the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth Courts. We live in a civilized age, and few places are more civilized than the university and its immediate environs. But parts of the Iron Law are left over from darker times. It had been a hundred years since anyone had been burned for consortation or unnatural arts, but the laws were still there. The ink was faded, but the words were clear. Ambrose wasn't directly involved, of course. He was much too clever for that. This sort of trial was bad for the university's reputation. If Ambrose had brought this case against me, it would have infuriated the masters. 
They worked hard to protect the good name of the university in general, and of the Arcana in particular. So Ambrose was in no way connected with the charges. Instead, the case was brought before Imray's courts by a handful of Imray's influential nobles. Oh, certainly they knew Ambrose, but that wasn't incriminating. Ambrose knew everyone with power, blood, or money on either side of the river, after all. Thus was I brought up against the Iron Law. For the space of six days, it was a source of extraordinary irritation and anxiety to me. It disrupted my studies, brought my work in the fishery to a standstill, and drove the final nail into the coffin I used to bury my hopes of ever finding a local patron. What started as a terrifying experience quickly became a tedious process filled with pomp and ritual. More than 40 letters of testimony were read aloud, confirmed, and copied into the official records. There were days filled with nothing but long speeches, quotations from the Iron Law, points of procedure, formal modes of address, old men reading out of old books. I defended myself to the best of my ability, first in the Commonwealth Court, then in church courts as well. Arwell and Elsa Dahl spoke on my behalf, or rather, they wrote letters, then read them aloud to the court. In the end, I was cleared of any wrongdoing. I thought I was vindicated. I thought I had won. But I was still terribly naive in many ways. Chapter 46, Interlude, A Bit of Fiddle Fulk came slowly to his feet and gave a quick stretch. Let's pause there for now, he said. I expect we'll see more than the usual number of people for lunch today. I need to check on the soup and get a few things ready. He nodded to Chronicle. You might want to do the same. Chronicle remained seated. Wait a minute, he said. This was your trial at Imre. He looked down at the page, dismayed. That's it? That's it, Wolf said. Not much to it, really. But that's the first story I ever heard about you when I came to the university, Chronicler protested. How you learned Tema in a day. How you spoke your entire defense in verse, and they applauded afterwards. How you... A lot of nonsense, I expect, Wolf said dismissively as he walked back to the bar. You've got the bones of it. Chronicler looked down at the page. You seem to be giving it pretty short shrift. If you're desperate for the full account, you can find it elsewhere, Folk said. Dozens of people saw the trial. There are already two full written accounts. I see no need to add a third. Chronicler was taken aback. You've already spoken to a historian about this? Quote chuckled deep in his throat. You sound like a jilted lover. He began to bring out stacks of bowls and plates from beneath the bar. Rest assured, you're the first to get my story. You said there were written accounts, Chronicler said. Then his eyes widened. Are you telling me you've written a memoir? There was a strange note in the scribe's voice, something almost like hunger. Quoth frowned. No, not really. He gave a gusty sigh. I started something of the sort, but I gave it up as a bad idea. You wrote all the way to your trial in Imre, Chronicler said, looking at the paper in front of him. Only then did he realize he was still holding his pen poised above the page. He began to unscrew and clean the brass nib of the pen on the clock with an air of vast irritation. If you already had all this written down, you could have saved me cramping my hand for the last day and a half. Cork's forehead creased in confusion. What? Chronicler rubbed the nib briskly with a cloth, every motion screaming with affronted dignity. I should have known, he said. It all fit together too smoothly. He glared up. Do you know how much this paper cost me? He made an angry gesture to the satchel that held the finished pages. Quoth simply stared at him for a moment, then laughed with sudden understanding. You misunderstand. I gave up the memoir after a day or so. I wrote a handful of pages. Mind the map. The irritation faded from Chronicle's face, leaving a sheepish expression. Oh. You are like a wounded lover, 
both said, amused. Good Lord, calm yourself. My story is virginal. Yours are the first hands to touch it. He shook his head. There's something different about writing a story down. I don't seem to have the knack for it. It came out all wrong. I'd love to see what you wrote, Chronicler said, leaning forward in his chair, even if it's just a few pages. It was quite a while ago, Quote said. I don't know if I remember where the pages are. They're up in your room, Rishi, Bast said brightly. On your desk. Quote gave a deep sigh. I was trying to be gracious, Bast. The truth is, there's nothing on them worth showing to anyone. If I'd written anything worth reading, I would have kept writing it. He walked into the kitchen, and there were muted, bustling sounds from the back room. Good try, Bast said softly, but it's a lost cause. I've tried. Don't coach me, Chronicler said testily. I know how to get a story out of a person. There was more bumping from the back room, a splash of water, the sound of a door closing. Chronicler looked at Bast. Shouldn't you go help him? Bast shrugged, lounging further back into his chair. After a moment, Quoth emerged from the back room, carrying a cutting board and a bowl full of freshly scrubbed vegetables. I'm afraid I'm still confused, Chronicler said. How can there already be two written accounts if you never wrote it yourself or talked to a historian? Never been brought to trial, have you? Quoth said, amused. The Commonwealth courts keep painstaking records, and the church is even more obsessive. If you have a desperate desire for the details, you can dig around in their deposition ledgers and act books, respectively. That might be the case, Chronicler said, but your account of the trial would be tedious, Wolf said. He finished paring the carrots and began to cut them. Endless formal speeches and readings from the Book of the Path. It was tedious to live through, and it would be tedious to repeat. He brushed the sliced carrots from the board into a nearby bowl. I've probably kept us at the university too long anyway, he said. We'll need the time for other things. Things no one has ever seen or heard. Freshy, no! Bast shouted in alarm, sitting bolt upright in his chair. His expression was plaintive as he pointed to the bar. Beef! Quoth looked down at the dark red root on the cutting board, as if surprised to see it there. Don't put beets in the soup, Reshi, Bast said. They're foul! A lot of people like beets, Bast, Quoth said. And they're helpful. Good for the blood. I hate beets, Bast said piteously. Well, Quoth said calmly, since I'm finishing the soup, I get to pick what goes into it. Bast came to his feet and stomped toward the bar. I'll take care of it then, he said impatiently, making a shooing motion. You go get some sausage and one of those vain cheeses. He pushed Quoth toward the basement steps before storming into the kitchen, muttering. Soon there was the sound of rattling and thumping from the back room. Quoth looked at Chronicle and gave a wide, lazy smile. People began to trickle into the waystone inn. They came in twos and threes, smelling of sweat and horses and freshly mown wheat. They laughed and talked and tracked chaff across the clean wooden floors. Chronicler did a brisk business. Folks sat leaning forward in their chairs, sometimes gesturing with their hands, sometimes speaking with slow deliberation. The scribe's face was impassive as his pen scratched across the page, occasionally starting back for ink. Bast and the man who called himself Coat worked together as a comfortable team. They served up soup and bread, apples, cheese, and sausage, beer and ale and cool water from the pump out back. There was roasted mutton, too, for those who wanted it, and fresh apple pie. Men and women smiled and relaxed, glad to be off their feet and sitting in the shade. The room was full of the gentle buzz of conversation as folk gossiped with neighbors they had known their whole lives. Familiar insults, soft and harmless as butter, were traded back and forth, and friends had comfortable arguments about whose turn it was to buy the beer. But underneath it all, there was a tension in the room, 
A stranger would never have noticed it, but it was there, dark and silent as an undertow. No one spoke of taxes or army or how they had begun to lock their doors at night. No one spoke of what had happened in the inn the night before. No one eyed the stretch of well-scrubbed wooden floor that didn't show a trace of blood. Instead, there were jokes and stories. A young wife kissed her husband, drawing whistles and hoots from the rest of the room. Old man Benton tried to lift up the hem of the widow Creel's skirt with his cane, cackling when she swatted him. A pair of little girls chased each other around the tables, shrieking and laughing while everyone watched and smiled fond smiles. It helped a bit. It was all that you could do. The inn's door banged open. Old Cobb, Graham, and Jake trudged in out of the brilliant midday sunlight. Hello, Colt! Old Cobb called, looking around at the handful of people spread around the inn. You've got a bit of a crowd in here today. You missed the bigger part of it, Bast said. We were downright frantic for a while. Anything left for the stragglers? Graham asked as he sank onto his stool. Before he could reply, a bull-shouldered man clattered an empty plate onto the bar and set a fork down gently beside it. That, he said in a booming voice, was a damn fine pie. A thin woman with a pinched face stood next to him. Don't you cuss, Elias, she said sharply. There's no call for that. Oh, honey, the big man said. Don't get yourself in a whip. Damn fine is a kind of apple, isn't it? He grinned around at the folks sitting at the bar. Sort of foreign apple from Orphanator. They named it after Baron Damfine, if I remember correct. Graham grinned back at him. I think I heard that. The woman glared at all of them. I got these from the Bentons, the innkeeper said meekly. Oh, the big farmer said with a smile. That's my mistake, then. He picked up a crumb of crust from the plate and chewed it speculatively. I'd swear it was a damn fine pie for all that. Maybe the Bentons got them some damn fine apples and don't know it. His wife sniffed, then saw a chronicler sitting idle at his table and pulled her husband away. Old Cobb watched them go, shaking his head. I don't know what that woman needs in her life to make her a little happy, he said. But I hope she finds it before she pecks old Eli bloody. Jake and Graham made vague grumbles of agreement. Nice to see folks filling up the place. Old Cobb looked at the red-haired man behind the bar. You're a fine cook, Colt. And you've got the best beer in 20 miles. All folk need is a bit of an excuse to stop by. Old Cobb tapped the side of his nose speculatively. You know, he said to the innkeeper, you should bring in a singer or summit on nights. Hell, even the Orison boy can play a bit of his daddy's fiddle. I bet he'd be glad to come in for the price of a couple drinks. He looked around at the inn. A little music is just what this place needs. The innkeeper nodded. His expression was so easy and amiable. It almost wasn't an expression at all. I expect you're right, Cope said. His voice was perfectly calm. It was a perfectly normal voice. It was colorless and clear as window glass. Old Cobb opened his mouth, but before he could say anything else, Bass wrapped one knuckle hard in the bar. Drinks? He asked the men sitting at the bar. I'm guessing you'd all like a little something before we bring you out a bite to eat. They did, and Bass bustled around behind the bar, pulling beer into mugs and pressing them into waiting hands. After a slow moment, the innkeeper swung silently into motion alongside his assistant, heading into the kitchen to fetch soup, and bread with butter, and cheese, and apples. Chapter 47, Interlude, The Hemden Verse Chronicler smiled as he made his way to the bar. That's a solid hour's work, he said proudly as he took his seat. I don't suppose there's anything left in the kitchen for me. Or any of that pie Eli mentioned, Jake asked hopefully. I want 
one pie, too, Bast said, sitting next to Jake, nursing a drink of his own. The innkeeper smiled, wiping his hands on his apron. I think I might have remembered to set one by, just in case you three came in later than the rest. Old Cobb rubbed his hands together. Can't remember the last time I had warm apple pie, he said. The innkeeper went back into the kitchen. He pulled the pie from the oven, sliced it, and laid the pieces neatly onto plates. By the time he carried them out toward the tap room, he could hear raised voices in the <coughs> room. It was too a demon, Jake, Old Cobb was saying angrily. I told you last night, and I'll tell you again a hundred times. I'm not a one to change my mind like other folk change their socks. He held up a finger. He called up a demon, and it bit this fellow and sucked out his juice like a plum. I heard it from a fellow who knew a woman and seen it herself. That's why the constable and his deputies came and hauled him off. Meddling with dark forces is against the law over an Amory. I still say folk just thought it was a demon, Jake persisted. You know how folk are. I know folk, old Cobb scowled. I've been around longer than you, Jacob, and I know my own story, too. There was a long moment of tense silence at the bar before Jake looked away. I was just saying, he muttered. The innkeeper slid a bowl of soup toward Chronicler. What's this, then? The scribe gave the innkeeper a sly look. Cobb's telling us about Quote's trial in Imre, he said, a hint of smugness in his voice. Don't you remember? He started the story last night, but only made it halfway through. Now! Cobb glared around, as if daring him to interrupt. It was a tight spot. Quote knew if he was found guilty, they'd string him up and let him hang. Cobb made a gesture to one side of his neck, like he was holding a noose tilting his head to the side. But Quoth had read a great many books when he was at the university, and he knew himself a trick. Old Cobb stopped to take a forkful of pie and closed his eyes for a moment as he chewed. Oh, Lord and Lady, he said to himself, that's a proper pie. I swear it's better than me ma'am used to make. She always skint on the sugar. He took another bite a blissful expression spreading over his weathered face. So, quote, knew a trick, Chronicler prompted. What? Oh, Cobb seemed to remember himself. Right. You see, there's two lines in the Book of the Path, and if you can read them out loud in the old Tema only priests know, then the Iron Law says you get treated like a priest. That means a Commonwealth judge can't do a damn thing to you. If you read those lines, your case has to be decided by the church courts. Old Cobb took another bite of pie and chewed it slowly before swallowing. Those two lines are called the hempen verse, because if you know them, you can keep yourself from getting strung up. The church courts can't hang a man, you see. What are the lines? Bast asked. I dearly wish I knew, Old Cobb said mournfully. But I don't speak Tema. Quoth didn't know it himself. But he memorized the verse ahead of time. Then he pretended to read it, and the Commonwealth Court had to let him go. Quoth knew he had two days until a tale in justice could make it all the way to Amory. So he set about learning Tema. He read books and practiced for a whole day and a whole night. And he was so powerful smart that at the end of his studying, he could speak Tema better than most folk who had been doing it their whole lives. Then, on the second day before the justice showed up, Quoth mixed himself a potion. It was made out of honey, and a special stone you find in a snake's brain, and a plant that only grows at the bottom of the sea. When he drank the potion, it made his voice so sweet, anyone who listened couldn't help but agree with anything he said. So, when the justice finally showed up, the whole trial only took 15 minutes, Cobb said, chuckling. Quoth gave a fine speech in perfect tema. Everyone agreed with him, and they all went home. And he lived happily ever after, the red-haired man said softly from behind the bar. 
Things were quiet at the bar. Outside, the air was dry and hot, full of dust and the smell of chaff. The sunlight was hard and bright as a bar of gold. Inside the waystone, it was dim and cool. The men had just finished the last slow bites of their pie, and there was still a little beer in their mugs. So they sat for a little while longer, slouching at the bar with the guilty air of men too proud to be properly lazy. I never much cared for cult stories myself, the innkeeper said matter-of-factly as he gathered up everyone's plates. Old Cobb looked up from his beer. That so? The innkeeper shrugged. If I'm going to have a story with magic, I'd like it to have a proper wizard in it. Someone like Taberlin the Great, or Serapha, or the Chronicler. At the end of the bar, the scribe didn't choke or startle. He did pause for half a second, though, before lowering his spoon back into his second bowl of soup. The room went comfortably quiet again as the innkeeper gathered up the last of the empty plates and turned toward the kitchen. But before he could get through the doorway, Graham spoke up. The chronicler, he said. I haven't ever heard of him. The innkeeper turned back, surprised. You haven't? Graham shook his head. I'm sure you have, the innkeeper said. He carries around a great book, and whatever he writes down in that book comes true. He looked at all of them expectantly. Jake shook his head, too. The innkeeper turned to the scribe at the end of the bar, who was keeping his attention on his food. You've heard of him, I'm sure, Coates said. They call him Lord of Stories, and if he learns one of your secrets, he can write whatever he wants about you in his book. He looked at the scribe. Haven't you ever heard of him? Chronicler dropped his eyes and shook his head. He dipped the crust of his bread in his soup and ate it without speaking. The innkeeper looked surprised. When I was growing up, I liked the Chronicler more than Taverlin or any of the rest. He's got a bit of fairy blood in him, and it's made him sharper than a normal man. He can see for a hundred miles on a cloudy day and hear a whisper through a thick oak door. He can track a mouse through a forest on a moonless night. I've heard of him, Bass said eagerly. His sword is named Sheev, and the blade is made of a single piece of paper. It's light as a feather, but so sharp that if he cuts you, you see the blood before you even feel it. The innkeeper nodded, and if he learns your name, he can write it on the blade of the sword and use it to kill you from a thousand miles away. But he's got to write it in his own blood, Bast added, and there's only so much space on the sword. He's already written 17 names on it, so there's not that much room left. He used to be a member of the High King's court in Modeg, Coates said, but he fell in love with the High King's daughter. Graham and Old Cobb were nodding now. This was familiar territory. Coat continued. When Chronicler asked to marry her, the High King was angry, so he gave Chronicler a task to prove he was worthy. The innkeeper paused dramatically. Chronicler can only marry her if he finds something more precious than the princess and brings it back to the High King. Graham made an appreciative noise. That's a pisser of a task. What's a man to do? You can't bring something back and say, here, this is worth more than your little girl. The innkeeper gave a grave nod. So Chronicler wanders the world looking for ancient treasures and old magics, hoping to find something he can bring back to the king. Why doesn't he just write about the king in his magic book? Jake asked. Why doesn't he write down... And then the king stopped being a bastard and let us get married already. Because he doesn't know any of the king's secrets, the innkeeper explained. And the high king of Modeg knows some magic and can protect himself. Most importantly, he knows Chronicler's weaknesses. He knows if you trick Chronicler into drinking ink, he has to do the next three favors you ask him. And more important... He knows Chronicler can't control you if you have your name hidden away somewhere safe. The High King's name is written in a book of glass, hidden in a box of copper, and that box is locked away in a great iron chest where nobody can touch it. There was a moment's pause as everyone considered this. Then Old Cobb began nodding thoughtfully. 
That last bit tickled my memory, he said slowly. I seem to remember a story about this chronicler fellow going to look for a magic fruit. Whoever ate the fruit would suddenly know the names of all things, and he'd have powers like Tamerlan the Great. The innkeeper rubbed his chin, nodding slowly. I think I heard that one too, he said, but it was a long time ago, and I can't say as I remember all the details. Ah, well, old Cobb said as he drank the last of his beer and knocked down his mug. Nothing to be ashamed of, Cope. Some folk are good at remembering, and some ain't. You make a fine pot, but we all know who the storyteller is round here. Old Cobb climbed stiffly down off his stool and motioned to Graham and Jake. Come on, then. We can walk together as far as Byron's place. I'll tell you two all about it. Now, this chronicler, he's tall and pale and thin as a rag, with hair black as ink. The door of the Waystone Inn banged closed. What in God's name was that all about? Chronicler demanded. Quote looked sideways at Chronicler. He smiled a small, sharp smile. How does it feel? He asked. Knowing people out there are telling stories about you. They're not telling stories about me, Chronicler said. They're just a bunch of nonsense. Not nonsense, Wolf said, seeming a little bit offended. It might not be true, but that doesn't mean it's nonsense. He looked at Bat. I'd like to pay for story. Bat beamed. The king's task was a nice touch, Reshi. I don't know about the fairy blood, though. Demon blood would have been too sinister, Wolf said. He needed a twist. At least I won't have to hear him tell it, Chronicler said sullenly, prodding a bit of potato with his spoon. Wolf looked up, then chuckled darkly. You don't understand, do you? A fresh story like that on Harvest Day? They'll be at it like a child with a new toy. Old Cobb will talk about Chronicler to a dozen people while they're bucking hay and drinking water in the shade. Tonight at Chef's Wake, folks from ten towns will hear about the Lord of Stories. It will spread like a fire in a field. Chronicler looked back and forth between the two of them, his expression vaguely horrified. Why? It's a gift, Wolf said. You think I want this? Chronicler said incredulously. Fame? Not fame, Wolf said grimly. Perspective. You go rummaging around in other people's lives. You hear rumors and go digging for the painful truth beneath the lovely lies. You believe you have a right to these things, but you don't. He looks hard to describe. When someone tells you a piece of their life, they're giving you a gift, not granting you your due. Colt wiped his hands on the clean linen cloth. I'm giving you my story with all the bloody truths intact. All my mistakes and idiocies laid out naked in the light. If I decide to pass over some small piece because it bores me, I'm well within my rights. I won't be goaded into changing my mind by some farmer's tale. I'm not an idiot. Chronicler looked down at his suit. It was a little heavy-handed, wasn't it? It was, Wolf said. The chronicler looked up with a sigh and gave a small, embarrassed smile. Well, you can't blame me for trying. I can, actually, Wolf said. But I believe I've made my point. And for what it's worth, I'm sorry for any trouble that might cause you. He gestured to the door and the departed farmers. I might have overreacted a bit. I never responded well to manipulation. Both stepped out from behind the bar, heading to the table near the hearth. Come on now, both of you. The trial itself was tedious business, but it had important repercussions. Chapter 48 A Significant Absence I went through the admissions lottery and was lucky enough to draw a late slot. I was glad for the extra time, as my trial had left me little opportunity to study for my exams. Still, I wasn't terribly worried. I had time to study and free access to the archives. What's more, for the first time since I'd come to the university, I wasn't a pauper. 
I had 13 talents in my purse. Even after I paid Davy the interest on her loan, I would easily have enough for tuition. Best of all, the long hours spent searching for the gram had taught me a great deal about the archives. While I might not know as much as an experienced scrib, I was familiar with many of her hidden corners and quiet secrets. So while I studied, I also allowed myself the freedom to do other reading while I prepared for admission. I closed the book I'd been poring over, a well-written comprehensive history of the Aturin Church. It was as useless as all the rest. Willem looked up as my book thumped shut. Nothing? He asked. Less than nothing, I said. The two of us were studying in one of the fourth floor meeting holes, much smaller than our customary place on the third floor, but given how close we were to admissions, we'd been lucky to find a private room at all. Why don't you let it go? Will suggested. You've been beating this alien thing like a dead horse for what? Who span? I nodded. Not wanting to admit my research into the Amir had actually started long before our bet had taken us to cover. And what have you found so far? Shelves of books, I said. Dozens of stories. Mentions in a hundred histories. He gave me a level look. And this wealth of information irritates me. No, I said. The lack of information troubles me. There isn't any solid information about the Amir in any of these books. None, Willem said skeptically. Oh, every historian in the last 300 years talks about them, I said. They speculate on how the Amir influenced the decline of the Empire. Philosophers talk about the ethical ramifications of their actions, I gestured to the books. That tells me what people think about the Amir. It doesn't tell me anything about the Amir themselves. Willem frowned at my stack of books. It can't all be historians and philosophers. There are stories, too, I said. Early on, there are stories about the great wrongs they righted. Later, you get stories about the terrible things they did. An Amir in Renire kills a corrupt judge. Another in Jumpui puts down a peasant uprising. A third in Malifi poisons half the town's nobility. And that isn't solid information? Willem asked. They're soft stories, I said. Second or third hand. Three quarters of them are simply hearsay. I can't find corroborating evidence for them anywhere. Why can't I find any mention of the corrupt judge in the church records? His name should be recorded in every case he tried. What was the date of this peasant uprising? And why can't I find it mentioned in any of the other histories? It was 300 years ago, Willem said reproachfully. You can't expect all those little details to survive. I expect some of the little details to survive. You know how obsessive the Talons are about their records, I said. We have a thousand years of court documents from a hundred different cities squirreled away down in sub two. Whole rooms full. I waved my hands dismissively. But fine, let's abandon the small details. There are huge questions I can't find any answers for. When was the Order Amir founded? How many Amir were there? Who paid them and how much? Where did that money come from? Where were they trained? How did they come to be a part of the Tailing Church? Well, Demi Rice answered that, Willem said. They grew out of the tradition of the mendicant judges. I picked up a book at random and thumped it onto the table in front of him. Find me one bit of proof to support that theory. Find me one record that shows a mendicant judge being promoted into the ranks of the Amir. Show me one record of an Amir being employed by a court. Find me one church document that shows an Amir presiding over a case. I crossed my arms in front of my chest, belligerent. Go on. I'll wait. Willem ignored the book. Maybe there weren't as many Amir as people assume. Perhaps there were only a few of them, and their reputation grew out of their control. He gave me a pointed look. You should understand how that works. No, I said. This is a significant absence. Sometimes finding nothing can be finding something. You're starting to sound like a loser, Willem said. I frowned at him, but decided not to rise to the bait. No, listen for a minute. 
why would there be so little factual information about the Amir? There are only three possibilities. I held up fingers to mark them off. One, nothing was written down. I think we can safely discard that. They were too important to be entirely neglected by historians, clerks, and the obsessive documentation of the church. I tucked that finger away. Two, by an odd chance, copies of the books that do have this information have simply never made their way here to the archives. But that's ridiculous. It's impossible to think that over all the years, nothing on the subject has ended up in the largest library in the world. I folded down the second finger. Three. I pointed with the remaining finger. Someone has removed this information, altered it, or destroyed it. Willem frowned. Who would do that? Who indeed, I said. Who would benefit most from the destruction of the information of the Amir? I hesitated, letting the tension build. Who else but the Amir themselves? I had expected him to dismiss my idea, but he didn't. An interesting thought, Willem said. But why assume the Amir are behind it? It is much more sensible to think the church itself is responsible. Certainly the Palins would like nothing better than to quietly erase the Amir's atrocities. True, I admitted. But the church isn't very strong here in the Commonwealth, and these books come from all over the world. A Seeldish historian wouldn't have any compunctions about writing a history of the Amir. A Seeldish historian would have very little interest in writing the history of a heretic branch of a pagan church, Willem pointed out. Besides, how could a discredited handful of Amir do something the church itself could not achieve? I leaned forward. I think the Amir are far older than the Talon Church, I said. During the time of the Aeturan Empire, a great deal of their public strength was with the church, but they were more than just a group of wandering justices. And what leads you to this belief? Willem said. From his expression, I could see I was losing Willem's support rather than gaining it. A piece of ancient pottery, I thought. A story I heard from an old man in Tarbia. I know it because of something that Chandria had let slip after they killed everyone I ever knew. I sighed and shook my head, knowing how crazy I would sound if I told the truth. That was why I scoured the archives. I needed some tangible evidence to support my theory, something that wouldn't make me a laughing stock. I found copies of the court documents from the time the Amir were denounced, I said. Do you know how many Amir they put on trial in Tarbian? Will shrugged. I held up a single finger. One. One Amir in all of Tarbian. And the clerk writing the transcript of the trial made it clear the man they put on trial was a simpleton who didn't understand what was going on. I still saw a doubt on Willem's face. Just think of it, I pleaded. The scraps I found suggest there were at least 3,000 Amir in the Empire before they were disbanded. 3,000 highly trained, heavily armed, wealthy men and women absolutely devoted to the greater good. Then, one day the church denounces them, disbands their entire order, and confiscates their property. I snapped my fingers. And 3,000 deadly, justice-obsessed fanatics just disappear? They roll over and decide to let someone else take care of the greater good for a while? No protest? No resistance? Nothing? I gave him a hard look and shook my head firmly. No, that goes against human nature. Besides, I haven't found one record of a member of the Amir being brought before the church's justice. Not one. Is it so outrageous to think they might have decided to go underground to continue their work in a more secret way? And if that's reasonable, I continued before he could interrupt. Doesn't it also make sense they might try to preserve their secrecy by carefully pruning histories over the last 300 years? There was a long pause. Willem didn't dismiss it out of hand. An interesting theory, he said slowly. But it leads me to one last question. He eyed me seriously. Have you been drinking? I slumped in my chair. No. He came to his feet. Then you should stop. 
You have been spending too much time with all these books. You need to wash the dust from your brains. So we went for a drink, but I still harbored my suspicion. I bounced the idea off Simmons when I next had the chance. He accepted it more easily than Willem had, which isn't to say he believed me, just that he accepted the possibility. He said I should mention it to Lauren. I didn't. The blank-faced master archivist still made me nervous, and I avoided him at every opportunity for fear I might give him some excuse to ban me from the archives. The last thing I wanted to do was suggest his precious archives had been slowly pruned over the last 300 years. Chapter 49. The Ignorant Edema. I saw Elsadal raise a hand in greeting from across the courtyard. Cool! He smiled warmly. The very fellow I was hoping to see. Could I borrow a moment of your time? Of course, I said. While I liked Master Dahl, we hadn't had much contact together outside the lecture hall. Could I buy you a drink or a bite of lunch? I've been meaning to thank you more properly for speaking on my behalf at the trial, but I've been busy. As have I, Dahl said. I've actually been meaning to talk to you for days, but time keeps getting away from me. He looked around. I wouldn't turn down a bit of lunch, but I should probably forego the drink. I have admissions to oversee in less than an hour. We stepped into the White Heart. I'd barely even seen the inside of the place, as it was far too rich for the likes of me. Elksadal was recognizable in his dark master's robes, and the host fawned a bit as he led the two of us to a private table. Dahl seemed perfectly at his ease as he took a seat, but I was increasingly nervous. I couldn't imagine why the master's sympathist would seek me out for a conversation. What can I bring you? asked the tall, thin man as soon as we were in our chairs. Drinks, a selection of cheeses, we have a delightful lemon trout as well. The trout and the cheeses would do nicely, Dal said. The host turned to me. And yourself? I'll try the trout as well, I said. Wonderful, he said, rubbing his hands together in anticipation. And the drink? Cider, I said. Do you have any fallows red? Dal asked hesitantly. We do, said the host. And it's a lovely year, too, if I do say so myself. I'll have a cup, Dal said, glancing at me. One cup shouldn't alter my judgment too badly. The host hurried away, leaving me alone at the table without Saddam. It felt odd sitting across the table from him. I shifted nervously in my seat. So, how are things with you? Dal asked, conversationally. Passing fair, I said. It was a good term, with the exception of... I made a gesture toward Imran. Dahl gave a humorless chuckle. That was a brush with the old days, wasn't it? He shook his head. Consultation with demons. Good lord. The host returned with our drinks and left without a word. Master Dahl picked up his wide clay cup and held it in the air. To not getting burned alive by superstitious folk, he said. I smiled, despite my discomfiture, and raised my wooden mug. A fine tradition. We both drank, Dahl sighing appreciatively at the wine. Dahl looked at me across the table. So tell me, he said, have you ever considered what you're going to do with yourself when you're done here, after you have your guilt around you? I haven't thought of it that much, I admitted honestly. It seemed such a long way off. At the rate you're rising through the ranks, it might not be so long as that. Already a way right? How old are you again? Seventeen. I lied smoothly. I was sensitive about my age. Many students were nearly twenty before they enrolled in the university, let alone join the Arcanum. Seventeen? Dal mused softly. It's so easy to forget that. You carry yourself so tall. His eyes got a faraway look in them. Lord and Lady, I was a mess at seventeen. My studies, trying to sort out my place in the world. Women. He shook his head slowly. 
It gets better, you know. Give it three or four years and everything settles down a bit. He raised his clay cup to me briefly before taking another drink. Not that you seem to be having much trouble. Rilar at seventeen. Quite a mark of distinction. I flushed a bit, not knowing what to say. The host returned and began laying dishes on the table. A small board with an array of different sliced cheeses. A bowl with small toasted pieces of bread. A bowl of strawberry preserves. A bowl of blueberry jam. A small dish of shelled walnuts. Dahl picked up a small piece of bread and a slice of crumbling white cheese.
Yeah. <laughs> 